Thank you all for coming. It's an honor to be here this morning on behalf of Bliss, and it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Misty Hathaway is the Chief Marketing Officer and Senior Director at, for International and Specialized Healthcare Services at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. With 20 years of experience in healthcare, Misty oversees the strategy and operations for Mass General's concierge, executive, and international practices, as well as the overall marketing strategy. Misty has a true passion for analytics and data, and her work has combined the development of sound strategies, creative and effective execution, a strong focus on experience, and quantifiable results. She served previously at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, has worked in higher education at the University of Kentucky, and has even worked for the government in the US Government Accountability Office. Please join me in welcoming Misty Hathaway. Thanks, Amy. Good morning, everybody. How are you doing? Good. Thank you for coming out. Thanks so much to the Ad Club for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to speak. Kathy and Mary, Stephanie, Gia, Krista, Josh, the whole team been really supportive. I appreciate it. Uh, I'd like to thank as well Mass General for affording me the opportunity to work for a really terrific organization. Uh, my teams, my team members, a number of whom are here today on the marketing team, International Specialized Services, truly remarkable individuals and a remarkable organization. So I feel filled with gratitude to be with you this morning, both for the opportunity to speak and to represent such a terrific group of people and such a terrific organization. So how, think about this, how many of you have had some kind of experience with Mass General? Maybe you've been a patient there, maybe you know someone who's been a patient there, uh, maybe you know a friend of somebody who's been a patient there. My, my guess is that Mass General has probably touched you in one way or another. And think about those experiences, think about that interaction. Did it impact just you? Or did it perhaps impact another member of your family? Did you talk about it to friends? Uh, did you talk about it to neighbors? Were there others that were impacted by that experience? So we as healthcare marketers think about many different audiences and relationships. So not just the patient, of course, but the patient's family, maybe the patient's mother and father, maybe the patient's children, the patient's hometown physician or local physician who may have referred that patient to Mass General. So it's not just the individual customer or the patient who comes to us for care, but many other lives who are impacted by that experience in coming to Mass General. So as healthcare marketers, we think about this web of relationships and how we interact with all of those different people along that continuum. Not really a continuum, more of a web, I would say. So about Mass General, you probably know some things about it, and maybe there are some things that you don't know about it. Uh, we were established over 200 years ago. We've been around for quite a while, and we were established by a couple of physicians, Drs. Jackson and Warren, uh, who felt it was actually pretty dishonorable that Massachusetts did not have a general hospital where people could go for care, and in particular, the underserved, the underserved of the community. So if you had means when you lived in Massachusetts many, many years ago, you could summon the physician to your home, and the physician would take care of you and your family. But if you didn't have means, there really was no for, for you to go to be cared for. So they raised money from the wealthy people in Boston, and they established what is <coughs> Massachusetts General Hospital. We have four core pillars of our mission. Most academic medical centers have the first three, and we have the fourth. So the first, not surprisingly, the one you probably know the most about is patient care, taking care of people who come to us who are either uh, looking to get better, preventing disease, maybe something very common is wrong with them, or maybe something very rare. The second is education. So teaching that next generation of physicians, medical students, residents, fellows, nurses, physical therapists, occupational therapists, pharmacologists, education is a core focus of what we do. The third is research, finding that next cure, both bench research, so under the microscope, studying the molecular makeup of individual cells and figuring out how they're impacting one or another, the genetic code, as well as what we call translational research, all the way up to the bedside, so clinical trials, uh, those latest advances that might impact you as a patient. 
And the fourth is our community mission. So you remember the physicians who founded our hospital. That commitment to community remains alive and well and a very, I would say, fervent, fervent passion uh, among those who work there. Serving the diverse communities of Boston and around the world uh, is a core dimension of who we are. Other things that you may or may not know about Mass General, even if you personally have not been a patient there, you likely have been impacted in one way or another by some things that have happened or been developed at Mass General. So the image on the left is a painting, it's a reenactment of the first youth use of anesthesia in surgery. So ether, uh, as the story goes, was kind of a party drug, I guess, in the mid-1800s. Uh, and physicians who were at these parties, I'm sure they weren't partaking, but they were just watching, uh, realized that, huh, this really can knock people out, and I wonder if we could take that same concept in surgery. So imagine doing surgery without anesthesia, and then imagine how revolutionary that would be to be able to operate on someone who was feeling no pain. Think about how tremendously that impacted the feel of surgery. So the first operation under ether, as it turned out, was in our ether dome uh, in the Bullfinch building at Mass General. We were the first place to reattach limbs that had been severed in trauma. Uh, we developed PET scanning. You may be familiar with it, a very uh, sophisticated diagnostic tool that allows you to detect things that previously would have gone undetected in imaging. We invented the field of cardiology. Who would have thought of that? Uh, a gentleman by the name of Dr. Paul Dudley White in the 1920s and 30s rode his bicycle to work, uh, published textbooks about the function of the heart, and he started the field of cardiology from a preventive perspective, thinking that you have to keep this beating organ strong. I think now sometimes we think of cardiology as treating people with advanced cardiac disease, but the field of cardiology was actually invented at Mass General with an orientation toward prevention. And Harvard Medical School uh, grew up with Mass General. So some of you may recognize the Bullfinch building here uh, in the right image, the left building. The building just to the right of it, it, was, it was the first building of Harvard Medical School. Now, of course, over on the Longwood campus, but we continue to be the largest teaching hospital of Harvard Medical School. We also are every year honored uh, to be named among the best hospitals in the United States by US News and World Report, but we are the only hospital in the United States to be receive honor roll recognition across all 16 specialties of medicine that are recognized by US News. And what that means is that as a general hospital, we understand very well the confluence of diseases, comorbidities as we call them within medicine. So if you have diabetes, we also understand how that impacts your cardiac care. If you're diagnosed with cancer, we think carefully about how that impacts your cardiac condition or your mental health, uh, your potential for depression, et cetera. So that confluence of all of these different specialties of medicine coming together is what makes us really a tremendous general hospital. And then there's the two largest statistics which make me, I think, probably most proud to work at, at Mass General. The image on the left is uh, neuroimaging, as you might recognize. We have the largest hospital-based research program in the United States and arguably, I would imagine, in the world with nearly $1 billion a year in research funding. So what that means is a couple things. It means for our patients that when you come to Mass General, you are most likely to receive the most cutting edge treatment, drug, advances uh, that are available to you in your field because our physicians are practicing every day and collaborating with researchers and figuring out what is the next cure. It also means that the brightest minds in medicine are attracted to working at Mass General because they really enjoy and are stimulated being surrounded by spectacularly brilliant physicians, clinicians, scientists who are all kind of leaning in and leaning forward to find that next advance and next cure. The image on the right depicts the fact, maybe something that you didn't know, we have the largest hospital-based clinic for the homeless in the entire country. How many of you knew that about Mass General? I'm hoping some of my team raised their hand. They knew that, yeah. <laughs> uh, but a seemingly kind of contradictory combination of largest and first, but it's a, a dimension of Mass General that make me incredibly proud to work there. Uh, this combination of the brightest minds in medicine, but also the fact that commitment to serving the underserved attracts physicians, clinicians, people to work there with tremendously open hearts, who are confident that when they come to Mass General, their passion for serving the underserved will be nurtured and encouraged. So when I tell people what I do, uh, I often get kind of a puzzled expression. What does a healthcare marketer do? Why would a hospital, and particularly a really well-reputed hospital, need marketing? And as my staff helped with this presentation, they put together this uh, little gif to say that maybe this is what we do all day. 
it does, that confusion, I would say, is not limited to people outside of the hospital. It also is <coughs> present among our colleagues within the organization. They kind of look at you, marketing? Why do we have marketing? Why do we need marketing? And I would say at most academic medical centers, this was consistent with my experience at Mayo Clinic, an academic medical center being one that has both teaching, education, uh, and research. Why would we need marketing? We're incredibly well reputed and we're working with people who have spent literally decades of their lives working tremendously hard at the finest institutions, graduating from medical school, residency, fellowship, publishing in advanced journals, conducting research every day. Marketing to them feels kind of a little bit kind of promotey, advertising, and maybe a little bit tawdry and tacky. And really the last thing that a Harvard professor of medicine wants to be is tacky or tawdry. So one of our jobs, we've kind of some important jobs, is to persuade these physicians that we get it. The most important thing that Mass General does is taking care of patients. This is Dr. Kumanza, one of our neurosurgeons who recently had operated on Willie. This is his patient that he's speaking with, a spinal stenosis patient who actually came in the very next day for a photo shoot. Uh, but persuading our physician colleagues that we get it, what they're doing, complex neurosurgery, complex cardiac surgery, highly advanced cancer care, research uh, in neurological conditions, that's the most important thing that Mass General does, taking care of the underserved. But our job is to shine the light on that tremendous work that they're doing. The second thing that we have to do is to bring our best game to the table. So we work with individuals like Dr. Kristen Hung in obstetrics, who is a uh, gynecological surgeon specializing in pelvic floor surgery. Uh, or Dr. Leslie Bakri, a neurosurgeon who specializes in endovascular care and stroke patients or Dr. Arij al Mashari, who leads our bone marrow transplant group within the Cancer Center. These are people who are incredibly skilled at the top of their games. We need to bring our very best game to them as well. If we are to perform as marketing professionals within a world reputed organization like this, we need to be our very best, our most creative selves, our most analytic selves, our most data driven selves our storytelling abilities, our creativity, our curiosity. We have to bring our best game to these colleagues to show them that we get it. And our third job is to recognize that healthcare is a team sport. Conducting a complex surgery, conducting a highly complicated research initiative, finding that next cure, treating a cancer patient, Treating patients who come in every day through the emergency room requires not just one, not just two, but many, many people. And it can be thrilling and invigorating and really exciting uh, when that patient travels from a distance, doesn't know what's wrong with them, and Mass General finds the, identifies the diagnosis and actually finds the treatment and the cure. It can also, on the flip side of that, be pretty devastating when that patient arrives so far along in their disease state that there's really nothing that we can do or when the surgery doesn't go quite as well as expected and the patient dies. Those things happen, sadly, every day. There are stories of joy and thrill and excitement, and when we have the opportunity to interview that ALS researcher who's gonna find the cure to ALS in her lifetime, it's a tremendously invigorating experience. When we're interviewing the physician whose patient just the previous day had died on the operating table because something went not quite right and that a patient had been so sick before they arrived and we conducted that highly risky surgery, we also have to demonstrate to that individual that we care and we understand and we recognize what's going on in their lives. And that when we walk through the hall in our hospital, we have our heads up and we're looking at people and we're engaging them and we're smiling and we're recognizing that you are in a pretty sacred place. So as a healthcare marketer working within that environment, that's a really important dimension of what we do is understanding the true work of the hospital and developing that camaraderie. So challenges and opportunities uh, as in healthcare marketing overall and at Mass General in particular, our brand. So Massachusetts General Hospital, it describes beautifully who we are and what we do, but it's a lot of letters. It's a long word, it's many long words. Uh, and what do we human beings do when there are lots of, of really long name? We create shortcuts, right? We give it nicknames. We call it MGH or we call it Mass General or it's kind of fingers on a blackboard for some of us, we call it Mass Gen or the general, uh, all kinds of ways to kind of reduce that need to say the full Massachusetts General Hospital. 
So one of the things that we've been thinking about a lot in marketing is how can we present a more clear sense of ourselves to the marketplace? What we've done over the years uh, is kind of chopped that brand up into many little pieces and shown ourselves, as any of these examples here, in a variety of different ways, which is arguably okay, uh, but it doesn't really present a very coherent sense. And if you've ever walked through Mass General, you don't always know, uh, things don't always look uh, terribly coherent, I would say. There's different colors, there's different signs, there's different words. Uh, so we're thinking about simplifying. The other contributing factor to some messiness in our brand is our relationship with Harvard, which is terrific. Uh, you really can't beat the brand of Harvard Medical School or Harvard University. But when our physicians are published or quoted in the media, not surprisingly often, the media will refer to them as Harvard professors and won't mention Mass General. Or when they're publishing in Science or Nature or any of these tremendous journals, uh, they're often referred to, they'll use their Harvard title. So that further kind of blurs the line of and the, the definition of who we are. And then in addition, there's Partners Healthcare, uh, which is our parent organization that we established with Brigham Health about 20 years ago and currently comprises close to 20 different member entities. And I would say that uh, most people in the Boston area or New England couldn't tell you which hospitals or clinics are part of Partners Healthcare. And I would tell you probably that maybe only about 1% of our employees could tell you <laughs> which partners or clinics are part of Partners Hospital or Partners Healthcare. This is the back of a t-shirt uh, that a man who worked at Partners created for uh, the Pride Parade a couple of months ago. And so he, terrific initiative. They were having a float and they wanted all the Partners participants to wear this great t-shirt. Well, kind of ridiculous that he had to get 15 different approvals for local use to, to generate the t-shirt. I mean, there's gotta be a better way. So, a lot of, I'd say, brand confusion, brand dilution, uh, we're not optimizing our market presence with our brand. And while that's not the most important thing, which we all know, the most important thing is caring for patients, I think if we were to achieve better clarity with our brand presence, we likely would also simultaneously inspire uh, a more integrated patient experience. If all of our employees understood what is our exact relationship with all these different partners entities, we share the same medical record, we don't do a good job yet of clean handoffs from one organization to another. We're striving to that and we're building toward that, but I think the brand and clarification of the brand will help with that. As part of our brand work, we also uh, have spent a good deal of time studying what really differentiates Mass General from other organizations. There's lots of tremendous academic medical centers out there and actually, in fact, in Boston, there are a lot of really tremendous hospitals. So what makes Mass General different? this place that attracts the brightest minds in, in medicine and combines that remarkable intellect with this open-hearted kind of all-in passion for taking care of everyone, everyone who needs us. Some patients who are tremendously wealthy, but most aren't. Some who live in really large, fancy homes and some who live on the streets. Some who speak English, but 35% of the people who walk through our doors don't. Many from Massachusetts, but also from every state, every state, 50 states within the United States and 140 countries around the world. So how do we tell the story of who we are, uh, this tremendous organization located in Boston, in this life sciences hub, arguably of the entire world, surrounded by academia, surrounded by all of you, by the brilliance, the vibrancy of Boston, pharma, biotech, all here in one place. How do we depict that in images? in colors, in tone, in words. It's the kind of work that all of you do, but we're spending quite a bit of time thinking about our brand and our brand presence and how we communicate that in the best possible way. <coughs> different people who come to us from different places who are doing different things within the hospital. We're also uh, pushing ourselves to think about how we tell stories. And one of those stories is about Alejandro, who is a trauma uh, a trauma survivor, he arrived in our emergency room at about two in the morning, a gunshot wound victim, and his, the gunshot was just beneath his heart. Uh, so it had penetrated his thoracic cavity. He was given about a 20% chance of living uh, because of that wound was so close to the cart, tremendous bleeding. Uh, he had, at the end, over 20 hours of surgery, and his care team included 50, over 50 individuals. So think about it, trauma surgeons, cardiac surgeons, thoracic surgeons, all kinds of different specialty nurses, anesthesiologists, specialty anesthesiologists, nurses, occupational therapists, physical therapists, intensivists. That's the benefit 
of coming to a general hospital where you have tremendous depth and breadth of expertise all focused on a single individual. So Alejandro was in our hospital uh, for about four months, I believe, uh, and it took him a full year to get back up to kind of punching weight. Um, but the beautiful thing about Alejandro and about many other patients is not only did Alejandro benefit from the tremendous care at Mass General, but the care team benefited from the tremendous presence of Alejandro. And every single person, that, you, you see the smiles here, every single person on the care team said, even at his sickest moment when he was emaciated and he couldn't walk and he was in his wheelchair and they were working on PT, he would always smile at the care teams and he would always give them the thumbs up. And so there's this mutual reinforcement of very, very difficult work uh, dealing with very, very sick patients. But I think it feeds both Alejandro and it feeds our family, it feeds our Mass General family. And we're pleased to say that he's now back uh, living the life, he got his life back, the one that he had before, back with his family. Many of you, I imagine, as marketers, uh, think about your customer journey, mapping your customer experience. You know, how do people find out about you and how do they first interact with you and then what does that interaction look like? We're now doing a really tremendous study with our colleagues at C-Space, who I see some of them here today. Really great team at C-Space who's working on, uh, with us to map the ambulatory, that's a healthcare word, that means the outpatient journey. So, We've engaged over 90 patients across a variety of service lines to talk to us about uh, their patient experience at each touch point, when they were researching where they wanted to go for care, when they first called us or interacted with our website, when they showed up, when they tried to get to us, what their experience was like in the waiting room. C-Space actually shadowed a number of these folks uh, all the way as they were traveling to Mass General and sat with them in the waiting room, documented their experience. And as we look at these results, uh, there are some as you can see, kind of the peaks and valleys. There are anecdotes associated with this. The patients are rating each dimension of their experience, some of which are terrific, and the anecdotes are wonderful and they make us tremendously proud. Others which, quite honestly, are pretty horrific uh, and make us feel terrible and make us cringe. We're sharing this data uh, with our physician administrative colleagues in these select clinical areas to help them understand the importance of that experience and in getting it right at every single touch point. And interestingly enough, uh, for many of our physicians, finding the next cure for ALS or developing some kind of a screening tool for lung cancer, maybe it's a liquid biopsy tool where you're able to diagnose uh, through a blood test a particular type of cancers, feels easier than fixing the experience in the waiting room. Interestingly enough, for me, the waiting room feels a lot easier. <laughs> so that's what we as marketers can do. We can engage with our clinical and administrative colleagues, help them understand the criticality of word of mouth in a service experience. How many of you work in the service industry? I mean, you all know how important word of mouth is, right? Uh, when you leave an experience, you're gonna talk to, and in healthcare in particular, when there's such a significant knowledge gap uh, between what you're receiving and what's wrong with you, you talk about your experience and when you're looking for the next provider, you ask questions. Who's ever had knee surgery? I needed my ACL repaired. Where should I go? Who can recommend a good surgeon? I was just diagnosed with stage two breast cancer. Can you help me find the right doctor? Who knows somebody? Lots and lots of conversation and word of mouth in healthcare in particular, I would say. We need to get this right. Uh, we do some things tremendously well and we do other things uh, that really need some work. So this is one of the core focuses of our team is focusing internally on patient experience and persuading our clinical administrative colleagues of the criticality of getting that right. We also think about the dynamics of place. So a hospital is a very vibrant, dynamic, alive place. All kinds of things happen in this hospital. So there are some people walking in the hospital who are thrilled. They just had a brand new baby. It's their best day ever. They're so excited. Mom's probably exhausted, uh, but dad's carrying the baby and very, very happy. There are people who have come and they just received a diagnosis, they just got great news, their cancer is in remission, uh, they're wonderful. There are people walking through the hospital who are crying desperately because their father just died. Uh, they're very, very sad because someone was just diagnosed with something very serious and they're not sure what the outcome is. They're anxious. Uh, some are angry. They come from all over, they're all ages, they're tiny babies, they're 100 years old. Uh, there are individuals who are there, they're salespeople, they're physicians, there's researchers, all kinds of people walking through this space and it's really important kind of how that space feels when you're walking through. Many of our buildings were designed, well, the Bullfinch building is over 200 years old, but we have towers that were designed in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. 
long before anyone was thinking about experiential design in healthcare. And if you've walked through Mass General, you've experienced this. It's, it wasn't really designed uh, to think about that experience, that emotional experience when you're walking around. So that's another one of the things that we've been focusing on quite a bit. As we're designing new spaces and as we're renovating old spaces, which are very expensive, of course, you'd love to retrofit everything, but some of the spaces just have to exist as they were in the 40s and 50s. But as, as we're redesigning, helping our colleagues, helping our colleagues in facilities, architectural, uh, building planning, think about how is how you're building that space conveying healing, peace, a sense of a sacred healing space. Is it open? Is it full of light? Is it hopeful? Is it peaceful? Is it too noisy? All those kinds of things, again, that in the 40s and 50s weren't really on people's minds, but certainly are right now, aren't they? When you walk into a restaurant or a hotel or a hospital, I would say, or a clinic, you know, how does that make you feel? Another of the jobs that we have as healthcare marketers is contributing to the experience and helping uh, our colleagues think about space and spatial design. These are some examples that make me cringe a bit, but uh, that I've taken upon myself to share with leadership at some of the ways we're not doing such a good job in space. So if you look at the, the one with the red bloody hand, it just doesn't feel quite right to have a red bloody hand in a hospital cafeteria saying, stop, please don't open this cabinet. Or somebody falling to prevent slips and falls. There's gotta be a better visual way to depict that. Or the one on the right, uh, which is a map of our campus, and you see them all over the place, it's telling people that they shouldn't smoke. And so I'm sure in 2011, when this thing was designed, it was clever to don't smoke here. But there are buildings, there's a building, the Lunder Building, which was completed in 2011. Uh, on this map, it says building under construction. So it gives you a flavor for how long this poster has been up in our campus. Uh, but these are the kinds of things that we're paying attention to, and we're pointing out that you know we need to think much more carefully about how the space feels and the experience of the environment. A quick case study for you. So um, as Amy mentioned when she introduced me, I play a couple roles at Mass General. I'm the chief marketing officer, but I also lead a tremendous department called International and Specialized Services. And when I first started, one of our tasks was to launch uh, concierge medicine. Anybody know, anybody heard of concierge medicine? Do you know what it is? So in most primary care, pri concierge medicine uh, is an offering, a primary care offering. So most primary care physicians have in their panels, that is to say the cohort of people that they're responsible for, anywhere between 1,200 and 3,200 patients. Those are the number of lives of people that they see periodically and respond to phone calls, et cetera. In a concierge medicine practice, the panel size is much smaller. So in our practice, it's about 300 people. And it means that people who are members of our concierge practice have 24-7 access, direct access, telephonic and email to their physicians. They pay an annual membership fee to be part of that. Uh, and the benefit is that they have that very close relationship with their physician who has a much greater kind of mind share for each individual patient, can manage all of their specialty work, uh, is much more available to answer phone calls, et cetera. So it's a very high touch model of, of medicine. So we had a couple of challenges and a couple of great opportunities. One challenge, surprisingly, our biggest challenge was internal. So I talked to you a little bit about the culture of Mass General and that serving the underserved and this fervent commitment uh, to we are Massachusetts General Hospital. We were established for the poor and this is what we do. We take care of anybody regardless of ability to pay. So many of our physicians were, felt kind of affronted. They were offended actually by the fact that we would consider offering what they perceived to be two-tiered medicine. Like that's just so not Mass General. You can't, you can't pay to get better service at our hospital. So it took quite a few kind of small group meetings to help them understand that this is a small cohort of patients. They weren't gonna jump the queue for specialty access. They weren't gonna jump the queue in the emergency room. Uh, but we were creating a model that would generate margin to fund parts of the hospital that would go otherwise underfunded. We call this the Robin Hood practice. Uh, and it's a tremendous offering for the people who are part of it. It's growing at a pretty um, rapid rate. We're adding about 20 to 30 new members a month, we recruited our fourth physician. But our second challenge in this was designing the space, which was a really fun opportunity. And thinking about how do we design space in such a way that is welcoming, uh, that leverages the natural light. It's on the 10th floor, the, all of the practice rooms are on the perimeter, the physician rooms. They're designed kind of in a conjoined flow so that you never really have to kind of walk in the wrong direction from one space to another. A lot of natural light, greenery, uh, designed in a way to make that experience very welcoming. 
And another thing that we do, did in this practice was we hired a different type of individual. So we recruited from the luxury hotel industry our guest services manager, Eric was here today, who is currently our director of operations. He had no experience in healthcare, but he had a lot of fantastic experience uh, in the service industry, in delivering that high touch, expect, uh, expecting very, very high touch, outstanding customer service at every single touch point, and recruited and trained a team that was delivering that same kind of experience. So we've had really nice success with this, this practice. Uh, the marketing has been very quiet, intentionally, mostly digital, uh, but highly successful and things are going well. Some other initiatives, just like in the work that you all do, you try to think about how do you bring to life the stories of the kinds of things that your organizations are best at. How do you tell those stories? One really important audience for us externally are referring physicians or case managers or nurse practitioners who work outside of Mass General but might refer us a patient they might refer us a highly qualified medical student. They might collaborate with us on research. They're really, really important colleagues. So we de our digital team developed a fantastic content hub of information uh, filled with information, kind of the latest advances in medicine. It's called Advances in Motion across different disease states and clinical areas. So there are nuggets of stories about the latest research, clinical innovations, there's images. Uh, we engage a bunch of science writers who curate the content and produce nuggets of either written or video content. So some surprises with this, actually. We designed this for that particular external audience to talk about what we do. We've learned a couple of things. One is that this is tremendously popular inside the organization, which makes sense. We just had never really thought about it. Mass General docs feel very proud to learn about their colleagues who just published something in Nature and to learn about it here in an easy-to-digest kind of quick format, quick snippet. But the other thing that really surprised us is that patients are gobbling up this information, and not always the patients that you would think. So our most watched video on advances in motion uh, is this one by Jody Gilman. So Jody Gilman is a young psychiatrist who does research. Well, I'll let you, I'll, I'll let you see what she does. As legalization progresses throughout the United States, this is, has become a very important issue to study. And believe it or not, there's not a whole lot of research on the effects of cannabis on the brain. It simply wasn't a priority until recently. So what we're doing is um, batteries of cognitive testing and MRI scans and functional MRI scans to try to understand the um, cognitive impact of marijuana use as well as its effects on the function and the structure of the brain. One of the most well-replicated findings in the cannabis literature are the effects of cannabis on memory. So if you are a frequent cannabis user and you've smoked for a long time, you'll have memory problems. What we found in our lab is that this is dependent on the age at which you start using marijuana. So we tested a group of people, they were all young adults between 18 and 25 years old, and we did memory testing, and we found that, that the Students who started using marijuana later, so 17, 18 years old plus, didn't really show um, the decline in memory performance, but the, the students who started using at age 14 or 15 showed a remarkable decline in memory. So we don't know if these uh, memory decrements are pre-existing cannabis use, if they were there before they started using cannabis, um, and that's why they um, gravitated towards cannabis in the first place, because they had underlying vulnerabilities. But something that we have found um, and that's been robustly replicated in the literature is that the earlier you start using cannabis, the worse your outcomes will be. We're also doing studies in local high schools. So we go into high schools and we test kids and we're looking at frequent marijuana users and how they learn. And what we find is that if they stop using cannabis, which is part of the, the paradigm of the study, they learn better immediately within a week of stopping. And that's been really um, surprising to us, and I think it, it, it conveys an important public health message as well. There's a really strong link between cannabis use and psych psychosis, um, schizophrenia and other psychotic disorders. So we're very concerned about the comorbidity of cannabis use and these other psychiatric diagnoses. So I bring my, my background in psychology to these studies to try to understand the intersection of cannabis use and disorders such as anxiety and depression. People might think that cannabis helps with their depression, but what we see is that people have worse symptoms when they use cannabis. And that's something that hasn't been studied very well, and we're one of the first groups to study it empirically. 
It's our hope that the research that we're doing at the Center for Addiction Medicine could someday be translated into um, the clinical realm so that what we find out about how cannabis affects the brain, how alcohol affects the brain, could, some, could someday be useful to clinicians treating these disorders. So that happens to be our most watched video on Advances in Motion. And it's being watched not just by psychiatrists and psychologists, but the people who are watching it the most are young men between the ages of 18 and 25. Something we, we didn't create this video for young men between the ages of 18 and 25, but actually are quite pleased uh, that young men who are searching on YouTube for the effects of pot on the young brain are finding this video and watching it and learning it. This kind of research was not possible uh, a few years ago when pot was illegal, uh, but once it was legalized here, now we can conduct these types of studies and learn quite a bit. I'll brag a little bit on our Department of uh, Psychiatry. Mass General's Department of Psychiatry is the second largest department in the entire hospital. We have 750 mental health professionals, which is highly unusual for an academic medical center, at the forefront of studying uh, the relationship between mental health disorders and other disorders that people are experiencing, so remarkable. Anyway, a very unexpected uh, application of content that we had created. I Unexpected and welcome. The other treatment or the other content uh, type that we've been experiencing with our podcasts, and one of my pet projects actually is the podcast Charge. Uh, grew up kind of as a skunk works project actually in my living room. Uh, we were compelled and recognized that many of the voices uh, that were quoted in the media on, and healthcare expertise were male, and we felt that the public was being underserved by not hearing from a tremendous amount of expertise. Uh, based at Mass General. So we launched Charge that features the leading female voices in healthcare, really, really tremendous stories, and we've now had tens of thousands of downloads, uh, 48 states, 61 countries, people are listening to this content, medical students across the country, uh, we even had a medical educator in Montana send us a thank you note because she's using it uh, as she trains her nurses and nurse practitioners. Stories like that of Marcella Del Carmen, uh, who's our chief medical officer. She's from Nicaragua. She's about this tall. Uh, she was mistaken when she entered a patient's room. The patient's husband mistook her for the custodian and asked her to re leave the room, please. He was waiting for the surgeon. Uh, she was the surgeon, so she had to leave the room and kind of think about her own diversity and how she would re-enter that room knowing that the spouse of the patient would be very ashamed to learn that she was actually a surgeon, so how could she approach that in the most gracious way and kind of deal with her own diversity? Kathy Minahan is the chair of our board of trustees. Uh, she is the first female president of the Federal Reserve. She was the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston president for eight years. Tremendous professional, uh, talking about her experience. Uh, Dr. Allison Bryant, an obstetrician who talks about disparities uh, in health outcomes for various groups in maternal and uh, fetal mortality. Chana Sachs, uh, over on the right here, her nephew was killed in Sandy Hook, and she's dedicated her career uh, to educating physicians about gun violence, guns in the home, asking, asking families and asking people about how gun safety and making sure that they're staying safe. Uh, Dr. Fatima Cody Stanford, down on the bottom, you may have heard her story. Uh, she was a physician on a Delta Airlines flight and was asked not once, not twice, but three times when she was coming to the aid of a passenger on the plane, whether she was really a physician. They asked to see her credentials, presumably because she was female and black. And Dr. Frances Hayes, who started our transgender clinic. Tremendous expertise, tremendous stories. Uh, we've had a lot of fun with, with getting this content out there. We speak to audiences around the world. The other hat that I wear is in international marketing. Uh, patients from around the world, and when you think about how you talk to patients in these countries, health systems are different. Uh, how they make health decisions are different. Their health diseases are different. Uh, so we've got language, culture, all kinds of issues as we think about how we approach countries around the world. This is a sponsorship that we did in Bermuda, uh, sponsored a couple disabled athletes. The, world's, the World Triathlon Championship was in Bermuda a few months ago, and there were a couple of athletes who otherwise would not have been able to participate. So we um, afforded some dollars to sponsor those athletes and, and participate in that triathlon and give them the chance to compete. We work very closely with a hospital outside of China. We've had about a seven-year relationship with Jowi International Hospital. Uh, we've worked with them on things like facility design, training their nurses, hiring their physicians, uh, protocols and cancer and other kinds of treatments, an advisory relationship, so very careful thinking about how they can use our name, the branding relationship there. 
different ways that we interact with the Chinese marketplace. Uh, the image on the right here is our Weibo account, a social media platform within China. So different ways of telling the mass general story in different parts of the world. A couple more examples at the end here um, as I wrap up, just about how healthcare marketing is different, perhaps, from the kind of marketing that you do. So one way in particular, HIPAA. How many of you have heard of HIPAA? Wow, oh, that's, um, I'm impressed. That's great. Uh, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 96 that was designed to keep your health information safe and secure. But what that means for us as marketers is that we are uh, appropriately quite limited as to what we can do with information about our patients. So, of course, if you buy shoes from a shoe vendor or a department store, they can turn around and try and sell you belts and suits to go with those shoes, or they can take your information and feed it into a database and understand what other type of information or what other type of products do you like to buy. Uh, or they might even be able to share that information with others who can then sell you similar shoes or other types of shoes. We're very appropriately limited from doing that type of thing, uh, but it does kind of change the game for us as healthcare marketers in terms of how much we can kind of dig deep into our customers and serve them up information that we think is appropriate. The other, I think, is um, not just what we can't do, but what should or shouldn't we do. How many of you, does any of you remember this story of Target uh, 2012 where so data analysts at Target, big data and all the digital platforms, of course, are kind of a dream for healthcare marketers like us who love puzzles, right? You love studying the patterns of who's buying what. And there's more and more data out there to help us do this. Uh, and the game can be pretty fun. So there were analysts at Target who had developed algorithms around purchase products and, and purchase decisions. And so they were able to predict, you know, if, if customer A bought one, two, three, four, five different products over the course of three weeks, it was pretty sure that the next time that he came in, he would buy products six, seven, and eight. So one of those algorithms related to pregnancy. So if a customer came in and bought one, two, three, four, five types of products, they were 99% sure that that woman was pregnant and would be back again to buy things for her baby. So what they did, clever, right? Uh, they turned these data over to their promotional colleagues who developed a packet full of coupons to mail to the customer's home to say, congratulations on your new baby. Here's some things to think about buying. But just because you can do that, so think about that. What if, what if she had miscarried <coughs> between the time that she bought those first things and when she got that pack of coupons? Or what if she hadn't told her partner that she was pregnant? What if she decided she really wasn't sure if she was gonna complete the pregnancy. And in this case, it was a, teen, a young teenage woman living at home with her parents. Her father didn't know she was pregnant. And her father reached out to Target very angrily uh, and said, how dare you assume, you know, mail these things to my daughter for heaven's sake, she's in high school. Uh, as it turned out, she was pregnant. And that's how the dad found out. So just because we can do things with data, I probably could buy lists of people who are searching on depression or are, who are making searches around cancer diagnoses. Or we could retarget people who are clicking on our ads for disease-specific conditions, and we could retarget them with even more precise content relating to their condition. But we, as marketers, uh, we think very carefully. And I ask my team, anytime we're thinking of retargeting, to kind of put through a number of stress tests. How would that feel to you as a consumer? Is that appropriate? Are we crossing the line? Are we the, the trust and the confidence that you place in your potential or existing healthcare provider uh, is sacred, right? I mean, you, you, you take, take that relationship very seriously. And if we cross the line uh, and provide you information that makes it look like we know more about you than we do, I think that's inappropriate. So it's both how we're regulated, but I think also how we determine whether it's appropriate to engage the tools that are at our disposal. Because I, I do feel that healthcare is a bit different. So I'm going to end with one final story and then would welcome any of your questions. And I'm going to tell you a story about Jalen, which is uh, a story that we absolutely love. Jalen is a young boy uh, who was diagnosed in a very unexpected way uh, with adrenal leukodystrophy. I don't know if you've heard of it. ALD, quite rare. Uh, occurs most frequently in men and boys, one in 18,000. Jalen's mom uh, delivered a little brother to Jalen in the state of New York. She actually lived in New Jersey. She was a physician, uh, but felt 
Jalen actually was born premature. She thought, eh, you know what, she's a physician. Her husband's a physician as well. I think I'm going to deliver in New York at this particular hospital in case something goes wrong. We just want to be closer. Well, in the state of New York, there's a mandated screening test for ALD for newborns. There isn't that screening test mandated in every single state. I can't remember. Maybe about a third of the states have it. But so Jalen's little brother uh, took this blood test. They gave him the blood test when he was born. And Jalen's mom got a call a couple days after they went home. The little baby was healthy. They were so excited. It was great. Jalen, his little brother, uh, got a call from the hospital saying, this particular screening test came back positive. We need you to come back for round two on Monday. Uh, and you should probably, this is, this is potentially what the baby has. So the mom is a physician, even if she weren't, as any mom or parent would, they start researching. She's absolutely devastated. This is a terrible disease. It's a terrible disease. It fights the myelin, uh, and so it causes a dystrophy. Your muscles stop to function. Your brain stops to function. It's a fatal diagnosis in most cases. So she's panicking. Uh, she calls a friend in the state of Massachusetts who is a pediatrician who happens to know Dr. Florian Eichler at Mass General, who is an expert in rare diseases and an expert in ALD in particular. So she, her friend connects her to Dr. Eichler on a Saturday morning when she's mostly crying and panicked. Uh, and Dr. Eichler calms her down and talks to her and says, you know, I think you should also take Jalen uh, to be tested when you bring in the baby on, on Monday. So she does, and as it turns out, Jalen has ALD as well. So here's Jalen with his mom. Uh, early diagnosis is critical. It's unclear what the, what the um, prognosis is for Jalen or for his little brother. For now, they're both quite healthy. Um, there are bone marrow transplant treatments available and, and evolving as time goes on. So it, it's, it's unclear uh, what will be Jalen's story. But the family was thrilled to be connected at that very moment with one of the world's experts in ALD who happened to be at Mass General and who is now their patient, or now their physician. And the team who did the photo shoot uh, was describing how this all went. And Jalen, as a typical five-year-old kid, was running around like crazy. Uh, and they thought, oh, we're never going to get a picture of this kid. <laughs> I mean, you saw the first one with him sprinting toward the camera, but he was just running around. Uh, but at some point, Dr. Eichler whispered in his ear, and we're not exactly sure what he said, but this is exactly what happened next. So there was such an incredible connection between Florian Eichler and Jalen that they were able to sit still and carefully and meditate and be together. Those are the kinds of days and stories and photo shoots that make our jobs so incredibly rewarding. So thanks for listening. Thanks for giving me the time to share a little bit about Mass General and what we do as healthcare marketers. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. <laughs>